The following program is presented by the HTM Podcast Network. This is your United States of America. Friday, the 13th of September, 2019, and you are tuned into the Hitting the Marks Pro Wrestling Podcast, powered by the Roar Network at thegorillaposition.com. Presented by Hamian Media. And in association with Last Word on Pro Wrestling.com. On this week's show, we're talking about Access TV, some New Japan, AAA, your Clash of the Champions preview, and what in the hell is going on with Kevin Owens. But before we dive in, it's my obligation to remind you this is a podcast by the fans for the fans, bringing you all the news that is news from across the professional wrestling world. Find the entire HTM Podcast Network online, hittingthemarks.com. My name is Jargo. I'll be your host for the day, but give it up for my tag team partner. He's the man, the myth, the legend, the potter to my Malfoy, the real RBV, Rick. Welcome to the House of Slytherin. It's me, it's me! It's that R to the B to the V. Rick Vickery! Wait a minute, did, didn't I just do that like a half hour ago? Yeah, we, we just got done recording HTM Sports, and now it's time to talk about HTM Sports Entertainment for the Clash of the Champions preview. Well, well I, I was going to say, you know, I, I felt, you know, they're probably going to be dropping here around the same time. Talking about hashtag HTM Sports, I felt... We were more talking about the world of professional wrestling on that show. Everything that's unfolding in the NFL, all the drama, the the theatrics, the over the top characters. But hey, I, I know we got a tremendous run here today. We're gonna keep it rolling right in to what what brought us to the show, what we love, our passion, professional wrestling. We also have a big interview with WOW Women of Wrestling superstar Serpentine as she gears up for her big debut tomorrow night on Access TV. We're going to be talking a lot about Access TV with Anthem making that purchase. We're going to talk some Stone Cold and Undertaker inside the garden. But Huckleberry, we got to start off with this Kevin Owens thing. Uh, we we got to start off with Kevin Owens. This was the last thing that we saw on SmackDown. We saw this big angle go down between Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon with Kevin Owens being fired. And Rick, I've been going through, I, I started in 1996, and I've been watching WCW up to Starcade 97. And uh, I, I just got done with the Go Home show for Starcade 97. And you know what's weird about that show? Is they don't hype Starcade 97 at all on the go home show for Starcade 97. Hogan versus Sting, and they don't even talk about the damn thing until it's about an hour and a half into the episode. It's absolutely absurd. It's completely ridiculous. And WWE did the same damn thing on SmackDown Tuesday night. They do this big angle with Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon, neither one of which are going to be on Clash of Champions on Sunday. What in the hell are they doing? Like, see, I mean, they did. We had a little bit of talk there going back to that go home, as you said, was about an hour and a half in before they really did something uh, because they had they had other things going on. I think for to speak for WCW back then, they knew that show was sold. I mean, they're perfectly fine with that thing. And, and they had some other things on the horizon that they had so much going on that they were looking to go forward. They wanted to kind of jumpstart that to, to kind of get you going into the new year and all that. I can understand it from from their perspective. And. I think as well, as we look at this here with WWE, not that they've got this thing sold, that everyone's overly invested. I don't believe that's the case at all. I think WWE realizes that this Class of Champions event, it's really no big deal. They need to be gearing up for this television race, you know, this this arms race when it comes to TV. That's where their focus is right now. Uh, and it, it, what it really says to me is I see that they see that. So why should I care? The thing that really bugged me about this entire thing is number just the way that Kevin Owens was portrayed. Like Kevin Owens put out this tweet, 142420. People have now diagnosed that this is NXT. Those are the the numbers representing the letters of NXT. Kevin Owens going back to NXT, Rick, I don't even think that's gonna help. Like 
Dean Ambrose wasn't treated this badly on his way out. What they did to Kevin Owens on Tuesday made absolutely zero sense. So, number one, they have Kevin Owens flip and flop. He's turned to heel and babyface. I want to say it's like five times throughout the course of this year. And he did it like twice just during the course of freaking SmackDown on Tuesday. So, Kevin Owens is appointed the guest referee. The match starts with Shane McMahon and Chad Gable. The match goes all of about 10 seconds. Kevin Owens makes a fast count on Shane McMahon. Kevin Owens is clearly a babyface who's standing up for what's right and screw Shane McMahon. This makes perfect sense to me. They go to commercial break. When they come back from commercial break, all of a sudden Kevin Owens has turned heel and somehow aligned himself with Shane McMahon. You get the same result. Chad Gable wins the match in about 14 minutes. Shane McMahon turns on Kevin Owens, turning Kevin Owens back babyface and beats the ever-loving shit out of him and fires him. Like, even if Ben Hameen was the continuity director of what the fuck on the WWE, this one is just out of this freaking world. I don't understand what in the hell they did to Kevin Owens on Tuesday night. If I didn't know better, I would think he hadn't re-signed his contract and he was leaving for AEW because they buried the fucking shit out of him. Well, I, I think let's talk the big picture. Let's talk his return and and how they've handled him here. I mean, it was seemingly upon his return that we were going to get that baby face Kevin Owens. You know, it was like that every man. You know, we'd seen him out with the family. He was doing things that were relatable. And, and he is a, a relatable figure for a lot of fan base. You know, they can, they can be Kevin Owens, you know, outside of his athleticism. Uh, he looks like them. He's a family guy like they are. You know, he's he has loved professional wrestling his entire life. They were going to go in that direction. But out of necessity, because of injuries and, and shifts and, and Kofi mania. Now, you, you want to talk about how great Kofi mania is. Well, you know, for something to really rise up and be that great, someone's going to be the ultimate loser there. And it was Kevin Owens. Uh, and then you've got, you know, things going on where Daniel Bryan doesn't want to go work certain shows or, you know, what's happening there. So in, in, in a forces, Kevin's, it, it, they forced to move Kevin in different positions because he's so talented at what he does. He can, he can make those adjustments. Unfortunately with that, you begin to, you confuse the situation as in you kind of just mess it up. And then in the other sense, you confuse the fans as they don't know what's going on. I mean, it's a roller coaster. Which one should they get behind here? How are they, how are they going to support him when you don't know where he's going? That's your bigger picture. That presents this problem as we look inside the scope of just Tuesday, where I think it was just in creative. They were overthinking this thing. And it was supposed to be, one. okay, it's, it's mind manipulation. They're, they're playing head games. Who's going to get one up on each other? But as we always mention, it's six months of booking and under, literally under six minutes here. Yeah, I just the the way that this entire storyline has been handled, just cutting bait with Kevin Owens at this point might be the best bet. So I guess that's where the NXT thing kind of fits in. Obviously, the full sale crowd is going to pop for Kevin Owens if that is in fact what happens. He ends up going back to NXT. He's going to be fine inside a full sale. But I wonder what the average viewer is going to think seeing Kevin Owens presented in a completely different context yet again. Like if you see you tune into NXT, you see Kevin Owens and you're just think, oh, my God, this is the same bullshit that they've had on SmackDown forever. I don't want to watch this. Yeah, and I mean, it's where do you make that disconnect? I mean, when you got that stank on you, you know, is it going to carry over? And going back to how they booked this thing Tuesday, they they really booked themselves into the crapper here. I mean, you could have been very simple here. I, I thought it was very intriguing. You know, they they had people hooked on this thing. I mean, people were getting furious uh, checking out some of the different. Uh, live discussion, especially over on Facebook and how many media discussion, but people are getting seriously furious that Shane McMahon could potentially go on to win this King of the Ring and we can get the same thing that we saw in Best in the World. Uh, I thought that was a great hook. Uh, that's very simplistic. You know, you're just, oh man, not uh, another McMahon. The McMahons are above all the brand or above all the superstars. And here we go again. It's all about old man, you know, old man Shane. He's going to get an opportunity again. Uh, that's got people hot. You could have had Kevin come out here and just screw him over. Keep that keep that heat between those two. And then afterwards with it, you know, this thing has been coming up. They just had a match at SummerSlam that if that if Kevin lost, he was going to quit on his own. You know, have Shane get to a point where he's so fed up. You know, he, he just got screwed. He couldn't get the job done at SummerSlam. He got screwed here. Hell, you know what? He just, I'm the boss. 
I'm just going to cut bait with you. You're fired. Give us a classic your, Nick Man, you're fired. And then if you want to have some goons come out and jump him, that's fine. Get rid of Kevin Owens. Then you can run in, if indeed, in this cryptic message, he's throwing out NXT with this, these chain of numbers here. Then you got a hot Kevin Owens where he's like, okay, you know what? My legal team, I, we've worked our way through this. I got a, I got back in place here. I'm, st- I'm back here at NXT. And one day, one of these events, Shane, right now I'm worried about NXT. We're going to get this thing. They're going to get TV rolling here. But one day I'm going to catch up with you. And if you still got that thing, you can go down, you know, go down the road. Talking about Jargo with, you know, you're asking, is he a big enough star? How they're presenting it, that's the biggest issue. Now, at its very basis, I think that he is. Inside the red and the blue, they don't, they, everyone's a superstar. They have no true mega stars now, outside of like Brock or, or Ronda or, you know, the, re, the returnings when they rely on the legends and all that. I think Kevin Owens going back to NXT present it properly, he absolutely stands out amongst that crop of talents as a mega star. Feel bad for Chad Gable. Uh, that should have been a huge win for Chad Gable. And instead, the story coming out of SmackDown is Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon. And it also seems now that the King of the Ring final has been moved to Monday Night Raw. So like, it's like not only did they bury Kevin Owens in this thing, they buried the entire King of the Ring tournament. Well, you have an opportunity to King of the Ring, you know, at its very basis was allowed, you know, it was to take, you know, that uh, maybe on someone on the mid card to elevate them, you know, a workhorse that just ran through this incredible tournament. Uh, I mean, if Chad, Chad Gable doesn't fit that criteria and is in that need of an opportunity like that, I don't know who is. Uh, and then on the other side, I mean, you got Corbin now advancing. I mean, this is a great story. You got some incredible heat that this audience absolutely despises and hates in Corbin. He is, you know, he's, you look at him, he screams what Vince dreams of, you know, and he's continued to be pushed. He's given opportunity and spotlight after spotlight. And then you got little Gable who people have been screaming for, give him a chance, give him an opportunity to get out there and shine and show what he's got. This, this King of the Ring final, this could have been epic. So not only in this, you know, what they did Monday, making that a triple threat in your semifinal because they, they wanted to have, you know, a lazy booking. They were afraid to make a decision around it. You take you, you kill Gable's opportunity here to really make this thing shine by, you know, he is a distant, distant second thought to what was happening, everything else between uh, Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon. But basically, why did you even bring this tournament back? What, what is the cause of this thing? It didn't. It, it didn't really overly excite in, in anybody. It, it wasn't laid out properly. It, it's not. It, it's not the fault of a tournament. We've seen tournaments. Well, we know why they brought it back because they they've seen how hot people are for tournaments in other promotions, and they thought they would ride a little bit of that pony. But in WWE fashion, they completely they completely muddied the waters here, and, and now it's worthless. And as you said, I, I I had to go back and look like three times to make sure I wasn't missing something that this match wasn't on that card. Yeah. For, for Sunday. Yeah. They, they moved it to Monday night raw. Um, and, and this is the thing that really bugs me about it. Right. So we have this Elias injury. It comes out on Monday that Elias is not going to be, or was it Monday or Tuesday? Might've been Tuesday, just shortly before SmackDown that Elias was not going to be able to compete. He was going to be replaced inside of the tournament. And then we go with Shane McMahon. So my problem is if we didn't know that Shane McMahon was going to be in that segment. If we didn't know that we were doing this angle with Shane McMahon and Kevin Owens until Elias was hurt. And this was announced on Tuesday. What in the fuck did they have planned? Because this entire segment runs about basically the last 20 minutes of SmackDown. What in the hell did they have planned? If this wasn't going to happen, like I I, went out, when you're talking, when I was talking about the brilliance of this thing, I thought this entire thing, and I, and not that it matters in our conversation here, but I think it dropped Monday afternoon. It was after we recorded the locker room now, okay. so that's why we weren't discussing it. It wasn't like presented on the preview. It was after we had dropped the show later in the evening or, or something like that. But I mean, the point of the matter is they're writing this shit on the fly. And that's why it's so fucked up because there's no thought put into it because we just we're writing it on the fucking fly. Oh, you see, to me. When I when I talk about how they had this great opportunity and I thought it was pretty brilliant, 
man, to me, this should have been something from the get-go. I mean, because how did Shane McMahon win best in the world? He interjected himself because of an injury and stepped in and won the and won the match and you know and got that opportunity. And now he's been running around for you know over almost a year, you know, claiming he is the best in the world. And who's one of his buddies? Elias. It, well, I think it would have been. I think it would have been so much better if he's even if you'd open that show somewhere where obviously Elias wasn't hurt. And he's he's putting it over like, oh, I, I can't go. I can't go. And then you announce that it's Shane McMahon. And then you could tell the story throughout Tuesday night of how Kevin Owens gets involved into this thing and gets himself in to that guest referee spot. It, you know, we talk about the six months worth of creative in six minutes. I think this entire segment was written in six minutes, and that's why it didn't make any goddamn sense. It's one of those cases where I guess maybe I'm giving them – I think I'm giving them too much credit because I like the direction. But once again, they, they completely missed the mark. Yeah, it's just so completely overthought and overproduced and it's just so disconnected. It's just like the, the, the Roman and Rowan thing. It's just like what in the hell are you people doing? doesn't make any sense. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the legends they brought back for the Garden this past week. Stone Cold and The Undertaker saw Stone Cold Monday night on Raw, saw Undertaker Tuesday on SmackDown. Didn't see The Fiend on either one, even though it seemed as though he made reference to both inside of the Firefly Funhouse. Rick, what did you think of Stone Cold Monday on Raw? What did you think of Taker Tuesday on SmackDown? Uh, you know, it was, I guess the letdown was these, the, the potential the possibility that you're going to have this epic encounter, something like this, and you get absolutely nothing from it uh, outside of, you know, people tuning in for it. And I, I think we were going to talk some of the numbers, right, on the ratings and that here a little bit. But uh, it didn't do anything to really move me. I mean, I was eager to, to see what was going to happen there. I, I flipped over during that was one that was, you know, tuned into football. Yeah. Really, and then really I, the only thing the rating did, or the only thing that Austin and Taker both did was they held the rating. That was really all that happened. The, the rating just basically stayed flat. Yeah. I, I think, you know, what's crazy about that is it moved a little bit because now people are going, Oh my God, you know, I mean, they're excited that it just barely moved the needle a little bit against the opening week of the NFL. And then we see, you know, the connection between NFL and wrestling fans. I mean, hell, the NFL number was freaking great. Yeah, the NFL number was off the charts. They had like 13 million viewers for the first game and like 16 million for the second game. And I think, you know, as you had mentioned to me off air as we are talking earlier in the week, that's more alarming to WWE realizing that people aren't just leaving for something else. They're just gone already. Yeah, your rating didn't move. Now, and I... And even, you know, individuals like me that maybe weren't watching that, you were out doing something else, you're a fan of those two teams, you're at a game or something like that. Man, if you hear something like that, that something happened with with Stone Cold in in the feed or, you know, Undertaker, you know, what you were going on Tuesday or whatever, and you realize you missed that, that's when you you kick yourself in the ass and make sure you're tuning in again. And they could have teased that Austin was going to be around in that third hour, too. Like, I, I think everybody was kind of surprised when he came out in that third hour. It's like, if you look at the viewership, that first hour, they, they lost like 800,000 viewers first to third. Part of that was the finish of the Texans and Saints game. The other part of that was Austin opened the show and then people changed the channel. It was like, cause they've already seen him. They, they didn't think that Austin was actually going to come out at the end of the show as well. Uh, and, and you and you do that very simple. You run a real quick segment in the back where it looks like Austin's going to get in his truck, but no, that's not what he's doing. He gets out a lawn chair and a, and a cooler full of beer, and he's going to go find a TV because he doesn't want to miss, you know, the main event. Yeah, or, heaven, heaven forbid you actually put over the stars that, you know, Austin actually, Austin wants to see Seth Rollins wrestle. Maybe I want to see Seth Rollins wrestle. Right. Yeah, if if, if Stone Cold's going to be invested, want to check this out? Then, uh, yeah, then the average Joe is correct. And, and don't just put over, hey, I know... I got a little look at the run. I know what we got tonight. I know it's advertised. I want to see these horsewomen go out at the tag match. And I want to see what happens in the main event. You have Austin pitch that for you. Now people are wondering, okay, Austin's here. And every now and then you get a reaction of him because they do that stupid, you know, that watch along party during their pay-per-view events. Hey, show Austin in the back, just sitting there, kicking back, stone cold style. You ain't got to be anywhere fancy. 
some old TV and he's just sipping on some Steve Weisers. Yep. That's all you needed to do. Undertaker, on the other hand, comes out Tuesday on SmackDown. People, did, not nearly as many people, number one, paid to see The Undertaker. Number two, not nearly as many people tuned in to see The Undertaker. Undertaker comes out, cuts his promo, choke slam Sami Zayn straight to hell. I mean, it should have been a great moment because people should be annoyed by Sami Zayn, even though all he's doing is standing in the ring and speaking the truth. Um, is Undertaker has... We, we talked so much over the course of the years, especially since Brock beat him at WrestleMania, ending the streak. There's been so much talk about Undertaker continuing to return, and we don't want to see Undertaker damage his legacy. Is it already done? No, I, I, don't, I wouldn't go to that extent. And I'm one of those people that defend it. You know, you know what right do we have to, you know, to tell him what to do? Uh, if he goes out there and, and he and he still gets that reaction. I mean, it's still in the, you know, the audience is in awe every time with those entrances there. But it wasn't we, Stone Cold level. Well, well, because it's so it's few and far between that we have those. I mean, you've got Undertaker. Yeah, when we were used to it, we knew we were getting him for WrestleMania. We had him for a year, but now we're getting to he's you know he's more approaching that Brock schedule where we get him a, a handful of times, and he's more. Tied in with actually coming for, you know, the blood money stuff, which I think does hurt a little bit. Or maybe it's just not, not maybe not souring people, but it's just not as wowing as, as impressive because people just aren't o- overly invested in those events because they, they know the background behind it. I think you got to get back to a point here where you got to pull back a little bit more on The Undertaker. Uh, I Because he's not performing when he goes out there, he's not performing like Rock. He, he's not the beast. You know, you can see all the wear and tear and the years of the years in the ring on him here. Pull back a little bit more. Undertaker will be fine. People are still going to remember, you know, the legacy is as intense and as incredible as ever. Less is certainly more with The Undertaker at this point in his career. And I agree. I think we've just seen him way too much in 2019. You know, if we if this was the only time that we had seen him all year, it probably would have felt bigger. And we're probably going to see him again heading into November because you can bet he's going to get more of that blood money. Yeah, I mean, and, and it, it kind of feels like you get into this, those kind of runs, you know, where they're going to bring him out, obviously, for WrestleMania. So we're going to get he's, – he's pretty much going to be, you know, for an Undertaker run as a mainstay here. Yeah. You know, he'll you know, remember, disappear. Remember, he didn't do Mania this year. He just did the blood money shows. Right. I mean, but they kind of – they run in together those seasons. Typically, so let's uh, let's talk a little I bit. I forgot they didn't do mania. <laughs> let, let, let's talk a little bit about Bray Wyatt. Um, I think everybody expected a big week for Bray Wyatt. Uh, we, we got the Firefly Funhouse. We got the tease of him going after Austin. We got the tease of him going after Undertaker. But the only time that he ever appeared inside the garden was for a dark match. And it was a handicap match. The B team against the Fiend. That was the dark match. I, I I guess people will stick around to see Bray Wyatt and the, and the new entrance and everything, but inside of Madison Square Garden, you could have really given The Fiend that big moment, make a big career-defining moment, and instead we just ran the Firefly Funhouse pre-tape. Well, obviously, you created a big moment. You're at Madison Square Garden. I mean, just... You know, the, the mystique and the history, everything there creates that moment for you. Uh, you know, think it back. We, we talked about this. We talked about this in the locker room. We talked about it last week here on the Hitting Mark Pro Wrestling Podcast. What uh, We talked about that reaction and how it would be, you know, we've seen people just go it go insane when the attack on, on Mankind or Mick Foley and the attack on Lawler. And, and we question, you know, this is, this is the ultimate test. You know, I mean, it, Right, you know, Undertaker, but more so Stone Cold. Maybe they feared the reaction. They they just wanted to avoid it at all costs. So now they're they're basically teasing, and it seems like this is going to happen. The whole see you in hell thing. Whoever wins between Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman, it sounds like is going to be dancing with the Fiend for the Universal Championship. Does this just seem way too soon? Uh, absolutely. And, and I, I'm, I don't really have as much faith that, that they're going to, to get this thing right. Uh, but 
I think they're going to overbook this thing. I, I, would you be surprised to see a triple threat uh, uh, that, they, that they don't want to give us, uh, you know, they don't want to give us a winner between Seth and Braun to, you know, kind of cool one of them off. When you look at that thing, Braun taking a loss there does him absolutely no favors. I mean, it just continues on with Braun just being, all right, he's that big novelty guy that you just try to insert whenever you need something. And eventually we're going to stop caring. And I think we're about to that point where he is right now. Yeah, and he's, he's real close to big show territory. I called this shit a year ago. I mean, it, it's the problem is when you get somebody hot like that, it, it's what do you do with them when they're there? Because you get somebody like Braun, it's it's hard to bring them down a notch. Yeah, that's true. Let's uh, let, let's talk about Anthem and Access TV before we get into our previews for the week, because this obviously one of the biggest stories of the week. Impact Wrestling moving to Access TV the week of October 20th. Anthem purchasing Access or a majority stake inside of Access. Um, Rick, there's there's a lot of different ways to approach this thing. Um, I, I, I guess we'll kind of go by company here. Um Number one, as far as Impact Wrestling goes, where do you want to see Impact? I, we're going to have this packed calendar. We're going to have Raw on Monday. We're going to have NXT on Wednesday. We're going to have AEW on Wednesday. We're going to have the NXT replay on Thursday. We've got all kinds. Right now, we have Impact on Friday. We've got NFL on Thursday and Sunday. Where where does Impact Wrestling fall into the wrestling landscape in 2019 on Access TV? You know, and we talk about, you know, we're talking about it now, a potential rating war on Wednesday. And always, you know, the red and the blue, and how important it is, you know, for, you know, that, for that live audience. They want that high rating there. Obviously, your, your value with wrestling is it is and, and you've. You've talked us through this many a times. It's the value of live must-see television as opposed to the DVR. Could you – I mean if you're a company like that, it like, like Impact, you're on Access. Do you realize – I mean you've got a great hotbed of professional wrestling on that channel. Um, could you just kind of realize, okay, we know there's so much other content out there with bigger companies, but we do have something unique. We can reach a, a specific a specific market here that's going to want our product. What if you did like a Saturday night block? Well, they are doing WoW and New Japan, so that's two hours. Impact already runs two hours, so you're talking about a four hour block. Well, I mean, could you say uh, maybe you go back to a uh, you know a traditional? When we were growing up. There, there was great wrestling on Saturday. You had some in the day, morning afternoon and evening yeah. you know you, you get you know it, it was all syndication there but you know i would get uh challenge on a local channel wwe challenge wwf challenge superstars would be i mean that would come on at like nine superstars at 11 then of course you had uh, the 605 where wcw was running saturday night i mean to me ideally wouldn't you just go to tuesday wouldn't you just go to the smackdown time slot now so then you have Raw on Monday, Impact on Tuesday, the Wednesday Night Wars, and then Friday you have SmackDown. Well, and that's, that's what I kind of thought, but as we're talking about this cycle, and it's then you're, you're how, how tired are people going to be from you know continuing what hurts SmackDown right now is that we're t- we're tired of WWE for after three hours on Monday, and a lot of people don't make that adjustment there. I, I guess that's the easiest one. I'm just trying to think of something unique, way you can market this. Your all this great wrestling, and it's different wrestling. It's three different companies. It's different styles. They're different looks, different personas that you've got happening. And, and maybe you can get back to you know triggering those those younger memories, or you know just memories of the past. Because hell, I mean, just not as a kid, I was you know me and my cousins would get around and watch it. My uncles who were older, they would you know they would set up Saturdays around that. You get wrestling out of the way early in the morning. You go about your day. Uh, you cut the grass, you run your errands, you grocery stop the bank, you take the kids to sporting games. When it's all wrapped up, you come home and there's wrestling. There's great wrestling on, studio wrestling with WCW on at night. But by all means, stay the hell away from Thursday. I mean, that, that Thursday night game, granted, it was Packers and Bears, but they had like 18 million viewers for that thing. You want to stay the hell away from Thursday at all possible costs, right? Yeah, and let me ask you this traditionally 
uh, with, it, and this could take in a number of factors. I mean, this is about all of television, all of entertainment. What is the worst night for television around the horn? Friday. Friday evening? Yep. That's where shows go to die. If, if you see your favorite TV show is getting moved to Friday night, chances are this is going to be the last season. Uh, people go out on Friday night. They go out for dinner on Friday night. They kick off the weekend on Friday night. Like people just, they're not traditionally home watching television. This is why Fox paid so much for SmackDown because it's original live content on a Friday night that, and you know, they're viewing it as there's two things in, in TV that still draw ratings live sports and live news. This is why they want SmackDown to be presented more as a sport like presentation, which we haven't seen anything like that out of SmackDown, at least not thus far. We have heard some, some talks about Mitchell Cole moving over to the commentary team for SmackDown. I I think that's a terrible decision. Like I just, I'm not sure where impact is going to fall into this landscape. I, I, the logical place to me, feels like it's just it's got to be tuesday night yeah I, I, it makes sense to me and i think you know just immediately if someone's looking at the lineups and what's available they they make they want to make that jump I, i'm i'm gonna ride with my what i said man give, give me something a uh, little nostalgia man let's let's try something different let's let's come up with something fun package things believe me you know it, it's fun as a program in new japan on access i mean it's usually just catching up to speed yep. but it, it opens up the eyes on that but You've got a program as fun as wild is. I mean, that screams. I mean, what they got going on screams going back to the days of of wrestling challenge and superstars. Yep, absolutely. Um, A couple other things as far as Impact Wrestling goes. Uh, Number one, is this really that beneficial for the company? Uh, Obviously, they're going to have a lot more eyes on the company. That's always good. But this is still an Anthem-owned network. Like, this is not going to be any different financially than what Pursuit is. Anybody who watches Access TV knows that basically all they advertise on Access TV is more Access TV. I don't know if this is necessarily, when you look at the bottom line, if this is going to be financially any better than Pursuit was for Impact Wrestling outside of the number of eyes on the product. Well, that's and I think that's where a lot of people... The disconnect happens with a lot of fans and immediately, you know, the jokes of, Hey, we couldn't find a bigger network. Let's buy a bigger network. But when we really look at this thing, sure. Yeah. They're going to have a bigger reach here. They're going to be in much more households. They're going to be able to pull in more viewers, but what's it's the bottom line is, I mean, you're still just, it's, it's still a, a child company of yours. And, and then most of your advertising on there is just telling people about your other shows. It's not a lot of outreach and selling things like that, which means you're not pulling in those financials. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of curious how this affects any kind of bottom line for impact wrestling. Um, another thing that stands out to me and this one, nobody is talking about, and, and it makes me want to scream killer cross. All right. We're in a contract dispute. With Killer Cross, you don't want to give Killer Cross his fucking money. And then you go out and you buy Access TV. You clearly have the fucking money. Give some of it to Killer Cross. You can't afford to lose Killer Cross if you're moving to a platform with this many more viewers. Well, I I think we've got to look at it, though. Let me just go a little deeper here. It's not Impact Wrestling that bought into into Ant or access I, it's oh, anthem okay then anthem give a chunk of money to impact wrestling to give to killer cross he is somebody i will actually tune in to watch this show for other than killer cross i'm not sure there's anybody on that roster that i feel like i have to watch the show because this is when i get to see fill in the blank now that LAX is gone, I, I mean, you got Tessa, but I can see her on WoW. We have Tessa, Sammy. Yeah. Is Sammy still doing anything with MLW? I, no, I, I don't believe so. I've, is he done I've with been that? a little behind on there. I think, yeah. Um, he's actually been spending quite a, t- quite a bit of time here in uh, Southern Ohio working with Cody. Uh, I know they've been in the gym a couple times this week. I uh, got some things going on there. 
but yeah, I mean, but how important is Impact to Anthem, really? I mean, we're making this every, because they moved the wrestling show over there. They have wrestling on that network, and they have some other sports things going on. Everyone's tying those in. You, the company you work for, this might have be a bigger picture. Sinclair doesn't really overall give a two shits who the biggest star of Ring of Honor is. You know, this might shows. be a, this might be a bigger picture. We might just be because we are in this bubble, this hub of professional wrestling. We want to, you know, just dial in. That's our that's our scope. That's where we're at. But this could be much bigger than this. And when it comes to Anthem as a company, they might not really care all that that much. But they just said, you know what? We got this wrestling show. It doesn't really fit on pursuit. I, you know, everyone's we're, we're kind of a, a laughing stock because we can't get on you know more viewers. Let's just move it over here. They already got wrestling. It kind of fits the motif. Uh, a couple of names to be on the lookout for, uh, because you could see them showing up in press releases in the immediate future. Cindy Rosani, as well as Adam Swift, gone from the Access TV offices. Uh, Cindy was basically the PR person for Access TV. She was also very much so involved in WOW. Uh, Adam Swift gone from the company. That's the gentleman that originally brought Ring of Honor to HDNet before it was Access TV. So it wouldn't surprise me to see those names possibly pop up like on an AEW list when they're looking for uh, office people. Another big name is Andrew Simon, who is the gentleman who is kind of the the interact between New Japan Pro Wrestling and Access TV, still employed with Access for now. So let's let's take a look at a couple of these relationships here going forward. Um, As far as WoW goes. Uh, Rick, there's been a lot of talk that there is a a kind of a backdoor deal going on between WoW and Impact Wrestling. Um, I can shoot that rumor down. Uh, th- there is absolutely no kind of signed agreement between Impact Wrestling and Women of Wrestling. Um, the the go between here is Tessa Blanchard. Uh, what basically what happens is. Tessa has really taken a leadership stock inside of WOW, and when they are looking for new talent, they go to Tessa and they say, hey, can we bring in some of your friends? And Tessa brings in some of her friends, like Kiara Hogan, like Havoc. Um, I I, I saw your your girl from OVE. She actually debuted here uh, this weekend on WOW. She's going to be teaming with with Jessica Havoc inside of the WOW uh, Tag Team Tournament, and I'm, I'm... kind of leaning towards them to win it. Those are two dominant freaking women right there. Uh, But Tessa Blanchard is really the go-between there. Uh, The second half of season two is being taped this weekend at the Belasco Theater. There is absolutely no promise of a season three. At this point, there's no contract between Access TV and WoW for a season three. That's something that's going to be reevaluated as Anthem gets their people into place. Rick, what does this mean for WoW? And if WoW would end up leaving Access TV, what do they do then? Well, I mean, they are settled in here. How long did you say? Uh... Well, the, the way that this works, they, they tape 12 episodes back in May. That's what's airing right. currently. They're, right now. Then they're going to have a midseason break. And the episodes that they are recording this weekend are going to start airing in January for another 12-week run. That's going to complete season two and the 24 episodes coming out of that nobody really knows well i mean okay so at this point i mean what reasons would there be you know just speculation as we sit here and and what we know how you laid everything out here what reasons would there be for access to to can a product like wow well the big thing is what direction does anthem want to go in you know that, that's really what it's going to come down to. How much original content does Anthem want versus how much are they going to pay other programming for syndication? Well, I mean, this might be the direction they want to go in. They want more of that. You know, it's, it's okay to have multiple of these shows. You've you got somebody else there. You know, they're producing it here for you. Um, do we know, like, how, what, what is the cut? How much are they currently paying for WoW? Are they paying for WoW? I don't know. I mean, I don't, those I don't are know a, the a lot. Those are a lot of the little details that are going to play, you know, huge into the future for them going forward. Uh, I do have to believe a something like Wow, uh, out on the market. To me, it there's so much more appeal with it because it's very unique. It's something. It's it's its own dynamic, and you can sell it. I mean, it's it's old school wrestling. It's this you know 
women empowerment. It's tremendous characters, great athletics. Uh, I don't think they would have a problem finding a new home somewhere. It wouldn't surprise me to see a, a place like Netflix pick up a show like Wow. You know, they, they had so much success with Glow and, and the revamp of Glow. It wouldn't surprise me at all to see them start using something like Wow for original content. Well, you know, outside of Netflix and this, the established streaming service which we already have, I mean, we have got a plethora of streaming services about to hit us here in 2020. Yeah, Apple, uh, you got Apple some of these, TV. Apple TV's getting ready to go. Uh, isn't it? Was it uh, CBS that just went and told DirecTV, we're not even going to negotiate with you. Go ahead and pull our channels because we're launching our own streaming service. I mean, for them to really, you know, to bolster up in that where we're going to get a race for – you know, all of these these streaming services that people are going to be a la carding, they're going to need programming like that. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see what happens because there's absolutely going to be a huge demand for content going forward, especially with some of these streaming services that are all competing with one another, whether it be Hulu, Netflix, Apple TV. Seems like there's a lot of masters being catered to. Um, speaking of masters to cater to, I want to talk a little bit about Serpentine. Uh, Serpentine is going to be debuting tomorrow night, Saturday, on Access TV, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, Rick, I had a bit of an opportunity to sit down with Serpentine uh, here just a little while ago, shortly before we recorded HTM Sports. We, we did probably about 10 minutes worth or so. Uh, getting to know the newest WOW member of the WOW Superheroes roster, this is Serpentine. We'll be right back on the other side to talk a little bit of new Japan and some Ring of Honor as we continue down this Access TV rabbit hole. We'll be right back. Watch out for the snakes. Watch out for the watch out for the snakes. Yeah, watch out for the What's up, peeps, freaks, and geeks? Welcome back to this very special edition of the Hitting the Marks Pro Wrestling Podcast powered by the Roar Network at the GorillaPosition.com. Presented by Hameen Media and in association with Last Word on ProWrestling.com. My name is Jargo. I'll be your host for the day, but let's welcome in our guest. Coming to us by way of Tijuana, Mexico, she is a cold-blooded, calculating, smart, and lethal competitor, making her way to the WOW Women of Wrestling for her debut this Saturday night on Access TV. Ladies and gentlemen, she is the woman shrouded in mystery that we hope to unlock a little bit of today. The Empress of Snakes, Serpentine. Serpentine, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I, I must say, Your Highness, I, I typically do a lot of research leading into these WOW profiles, and I've interviewed a lot of the roster at this point, but you are a woman truly shrouded in mystery. Let's kind of start things off at the beginning. I know that you were born in Tijuana, recently became a U.S. citizen. When did you first discover the world of professional wrestling, and what has led you to the WOW superheroes universe? Um, I didn't... Um discover the professional wrestling scene until I was a little older. And then I decided since I have a, a warrior, you know, warrior's blood that it was time for me to get jump in the ring. So, and what, um, lead me to become a wild superhero. It's, uh, well, as you can see, I'm pretty special and very different. And that's what I'm bringing to, uh, women's wrestling. Fantastic. You you were discovered and brought in by the greatest attorney in the world, Miss Sofia Lopez. How did you first meet Miss Lopez? And what is the official relationship between the two of you? Well, she sent me an email like uh, seeking for work after I um, asked a couple of my servants that I needed something different and I wanted to come to the United States, especially to WOW, to showcase my new abilities in the ring and um she contacted me and she said that uh, she um represents some of the best um clients in wow and that's how we started very cool on the official wow website wowe.com they list your fighting style as quote unpredictable and unorthodox end quote Tell us a little bit about your, your training and what to anticipate seeing from you when you make your official debut Saturday night on Access TV. I mean, given the fact that I'm pretty uh, rich and in, um, in Mexico 
and that my ancestors, again, they're like fighters and warriors and stuff like that. Uh, I was sent to different countries to learn the different styles of wrestling. And that was, that's pretty much what makes me very different and very unpredictable because you don't know what style I will be implementing to win my fights. So I think this Saturday you guys will be able to see a mixture of styles and, and um, something very, very different that you guys uh, saw on um, season one. You're going to see one of the, I will say, the best matches in the season of well. Obviously, the snake creature is constantly changing, evolving, shedding its skin. It's it's an ever-evolving canvas. I know in looking through the Lucha Libre history that many of the performers find themselves connected to their characters as an extension of oneself. Tell us a little bit about how you came to the decision to draw the hood of the snake. Um, again, this is something that um it was discussed in... Uh, and we talk about how, um, you know, devious and how um, different a snake can be. And being a character like this for myself in the ring, it's, it's, it's important. Because I don't want people to, like, to know where I'm going to strike or to know what I'm thinking. And I think um, that's what snakes are pretty much like. They're very calm. Like, you see them, um, uh, you know, slitting through everything. And then when they're ready, they just, they just attack and they don't, you know, they don't take any prisoners. Which do you find to be more valuable, the the lethal striking or the cunningness of the snake? Uh, I can, I will say the lethal striking. The lethal striking, I like it. Um, speaking of snake like characteristics, I know a lot of snakes are typically drawn to things that glisten, maybe shimmer, shine a little bit, much like the Wow Championship currently held by Miss Tessa Blanchard. I have to anticipate that you've been following Miss Blanchard's career and scouting her for an inevitable matchup for the grandest prize inside of Wow. Yeah, I mean, having Sofia Lopez, who, uh, you know, she can pull some strings all the time and um, making my debut for a championship match, I mean, what else can I tell you? I can't come, I'm prepared to a match like this. So that's why I'm saying, like, you guys, uh, hopefully you guys are ready to see something like this do for, you, for a while. Do you feel that you are at an advantage over Miss Blanchard, knowing that you can sit and you can research her, you can watch the film? There's hundreds of thousands of Tessa Blanchard matches out there. I'm not sure anybody has seen you inside the ring as of yet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, I have a big advantage, you know. Um, I'm ready for anything, and I think... Um, you know, a warrior like me is not afraid of anything. Bringing up Miss Lopez, obviously she has quite a history going back to the old tag team division inside of the WOW superheroes. Are, are you going to be wrestling more as a single or is there an opportunity for you and Miss Lopez inside of the tag team tournament? Uh, Miss Lopez doesn't really wrestle. She just represents the, the best clients on the Watt roster. Now wouldn't I allow her to wrestle either because I don't want her to get hurt. So with that said, you guys will see me in more of a, a singles capacity. Are there any of the other superheroes that you kind of have your eye on as you're scouting the WoW roster that you're looking at making a statement towards after your debut on Access TV? I, I definitely want people that are on top, you know, because that's, you can make a statement by wrestling the best of the best. I mean, I'm not undermining anybody you know, uh, on the roster. But I really want um, Jungle Girl, Beast. Um, like I, said, I would love to wrestle um, Holly Dad. She's been one of the originals from the new originals um, in, um, in in the roster now. Um, what else? Like some of the new talent too. Um, you know, I just, I just want to show that uh, Serpentine is... is Nobody to mess. Nobody should mess with me, and and I want to show that with anybody. But those are the main main ones that I would like to to face. Are there future. are there any of the women inside of Wow that you could actually see yourself possibly forming an alliance with, or is this an army of one? For now, I like to stick to myself. As you know, snakes they don't. You know, they don't, they don't hang out with other snakes and, and make groups. But, you know, if in the future it's going to be um, 
conducive to me for to gain more power. Yeah, absolutely. I still don't know who I like to. So yeah, I'll have to talk to my attorney about that. Which do you find more valuable, the WoW Championship or just having power over the WoW roster? It's interesting. I mean, having the championship means, you know, you are on top of the top. However, uh, having power over the roster can um, say more than just having gold around your waist. It all goes down tomorrow night, September 14th on Access TV, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. on the West Coast. Queen Serpentine, we'd like to thank you very much for joining us today. How do the listeners keep up with you across social media, and how do they keep up with the WoW superheroes? Uh, they can definitely go on uh, at WoW, uh, Women's, Women's of Wrestling, and on Twitter. Um, and also you can go and follow me at wow at, at wow serpentine at in Twitter if they want to follow us and everybody else. And then you also can um, search us, search for us on Instagram too. We have a lot of stories there. The Wow Superheroes incredibly interactive. How do you feel about interacting with the fans? I mean, they're they're clearly a class below you. Do do you lower yourself to that level to interact with fans often? I like when people bow down for me. So yeah. That's a lot of the pictures that you see on my social media will be people bowing down to to me. Fantastic. We can't wait to see it go down tomorrow night on Access TV, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Miss Serpentine, thank you so much for joining us today. I will allow you to get back to ruling your kingdom. Thanks for interrupting me. I don't appreciate that. Watch out for the snakes. Watch out for the... Watch out for the snakes. I seen all the signs, I seen all the signs. They've been telling lies, they've been telling lies. Watching how I move, watching how I move. I've been keeping track now. Watch out for the snakes, watch out for the snakes, yeah. Watch out for the snakes, watch out for the snakes, yeah. Watch out for the copying what I do every time. They wanna take what's mine. They busy faking and telling me lies. Now I watch out for the snakes. Watch out for the snakes. Yeah, watch out for the snakes. Watch out for the snakes. Yeah, watch out for the copying what I do every right, time. Everybody. They want to take She is uh, quite the intimidating woman. Uh, you know, I, I actually interrupted. She was watching a movie. So she she was a little distracted uh, there at the beginning of the interview. I can only assume that she was watching Snakes on a Plane. Ooh, yeah. Very interesting. I think maybe she was doing some homework, getting ready for uh, you know the, the big debut there. Wow. Yeah, she's going to be coming in. Her, her management slash the greatest attorney on the face of the planet, Sofia Lopez, she, she got her into a championship match for her debut. It's going to be Serpentine versus Tessa Blanchard for the WOW Championship tomorrow night on Access TV, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Make sure that you tune in for that one. It's something that you're not going to want to miss. Let's talk a little bit about New Japan on Access TV, Huckleberry. Um, New Japan is contracted through January of 2021. So we're guaranteed at least like another 14, 16 months, something like that, of New Japan on Access TV. Although it sounds like the format of the show may be changing. Now, the way that this works, the the show is cut in Japan and TV Ashai sends over the segments, and that's where the English commentary and overdub was done inside of the Los Angeles studio, like when Jim Ross and Jim Barnett was doing it. As of late, they've just been having the regular English commentary of Kevin Kelly, and Kevin Kelly goes into a studio, does a little bit of overdub work, like to throw to commercials and such on Access TV. But it sounds like that might actually change. We very well could be re- having a return of Don Callis to New Japan Pro Wrestling as far as English commentary goes on Access TV. But that also means that we have Josh Matthews for the play-by-play of New Japan Pro Wrestling. It sounds like all of the production is actually going to be moved to the Impact offices, so we very well could have a very similar look between Impact Pro Wrestling and New Japan Pro Wrestling on Access TV. What do you think? 
Well, you know, if we talked about, you know, what is the involvement? What does Anthem want here with Impact? This certainly would lend to that they do have some plans here. It said that they do want to continue on and start promoting more professional wrestling, and they just want to kind of hub everything together, make sure that it, 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 you know, not that it just feels the same in the presentation, how we're viewing it, but just how business operates. And, and you streamline all of that for yourself. Okay, now I'm going to play a game of Stop It. There's a lot of fans out there that seem to think that because New Japan Pro Wrestling airs on Access TV and Anthem has bought Access TV, that now there's just magically going to be a relationship between New Japan Pro Wrestling and Impact Wrestling. And that could not be further from the truth. (laughs) That's just not the case in any way, shape, or form. In fact, the deal is not even with New Japan Pro Wrestling. This is a deal between two television companies, between Access TV and TV Ashai, which happens to own New Japan Pro Wrestling. New Japan Pro Wrestling is in bed with Ring of Honor. They're in bed with CMLL. They're not getting in bed with Impact Wrestling just because they bought Access TV. New Japan Pro Wrestling doesn't give a fuck that Anthem just bought Access TV. Stop it. Well, and, and you're right. You know, immediately all this speculation, in, Impact or Anthem wants to, going to make offers. They're interested in buying Ring of Honor. Hey, right here on our on our own platform. Uh, the guys over at the PW Hustle are absolutely all over this thing. Uh, I, I'm with you 100. percent You know, this is going back again. We got to look at bigger picture. You know, you know, widen your scope. This isn't everything not about professional wrestling. And, and I love how you laid it out there, Jerry. This this deal is television networks. This is way above what's happening in professional wrestling companies. Just because just Gato the- and Don Callis like one another, that doesn't put New Japan Pro Wrestling and Impact Wrestling in bed with one another. It's two completely different things going on here. Well, and it, it, what we could see here too, and, and people will chop up over this, you know, you eventually, maybe this does lead, maybe it's a trickle down, but that's not the driving force that everyone is trying to make this out to be. There's not some grand scheme where we're getting some massive merger and they're all coming together for this, for this big drive or what's going on. Cause and I guess, you know, it's fun to, to kind of to fantasize uh, about this this great unit coming together as we talk about how crowded we regularly talk about how crowded that, you know, that second tier that dance card is uh, to, who's making moves, who's on the move, who's the shakers. If these three could come together, I'm with you. I mean, I, I completely dismissed it, didn't really read in or listen to a whole lot that was being said about it because it just seemed asinine to me. Yep. Uh, and speaking of asinine, let's talk about Ring of Honor. Uh, there, there is a rumor out there that Anthem is trying to purchase Ring of Honor. Uh, this rumor was put out by WrestleTalk.com. That was the originator. Um, and that website is notorious for putting out bullshit rumors. So I, let's number one, let's take this with a grain of salt. All these websites that are reposting this, this is absolutely freaking hilarious to me. They're presenting this as a quote unquote news article. And the first line of the damn thing says, if true, if you have to lead the article with if true, chances are it's an ever lying line of bullshit. Um, Sinclair is not looking to sell ring of honor ring of honor is not falling apart. Now that is a little bit of truth here. And the little bit of truth here is in a weird way. Anthem already is in bed with ring of honor in buying access TV because access TV used to be HD net, which is where ring of honor started airing originally in syndicate programming on a national level. Access TV does hold the rights to a lot of that content. However, ring of honor also owns the rights to a lot of that content, which is why that content is already available on honor club. So yeah, they could absolutely run stuff on access TV from ring of honor circa years, like, you know, one through five, but it's not going to be 
the the current product unless Sinclair and Access TV come to some kind of an agreement for Access TV to syndicate the same show that you are seeing nationwide on all Sinclair affiliates. Uh, Ring of Honor, inside of the grand scheme of Sinclair broadcasting, is so small. I, th- this company owns 250 TV stations nationwide. Ring of Honor is such a small, small portion of what Sinclair does. But what Ring of Honor does do is supply anywhere between four to six hours of content for all of those 250 some stations nationwide. It's worth a lot more to Sinclair than what it's actually worth for anybody else to buy it, which is why the WWE didn't buy the tape library when this was brought up years ago, because Sinclair wants what it is worth to Sinclair and it's not worth that much to anybody else. That's the problem with Ring of Honor underneath of the Sinclair umbrella. Unless Sinclair's looking to move it, nobody's going to be able to buy it. Yeah, and that's why it's that's why it's safe because it it still it perfectly serves the purpose for its original creation. You know why they took it over? Yep. Because it, it's it's easy, cheap syndication, and, and you can continue to pump it out. I, like when you're talking about, they've got, you know, for the first three years that HDNet, they have the opportunity to use, use that, that footage. You know, one of my favorite things to watch on the weekly is uh, Stadium TV, where they go back and run the classic Ring of Honor. Now, you can see Samoa Joe and Daniel Bryan and AJ Styles in those early days. Hell, I'd, I'd be honest with you, I'd probably watch more of that than I do Impact Wrestling, the current. Yeah, and Impact's actually been a pretty decent show lately. It's just Pursuit and Twitch, like... No, I, you have to work at being an impact wrestling fan these days. And that just doesn't appeal to people trying to watch TV in 2019. Let's talk a little bit about new Japan pro wrestling. They've got a couple of big shows this weekend. Um, Rick, this is one of those tours though, that drives me insane. This is the destruction tour. And rather than just having one big show, that kicks ass with a bunch of badass matches on it. They spread all of those badass matches throughout the entire tour so that you have to watch multiple shows and they can sell a whole bunch of tickets in multiple venues. So Sunday in Beppu, Destruction in Beppu, IWGP Heavyweight Tag Team Championship on the line. The Chaos Team of Yoshihashi and Tomohiro Ishii take on the Bullet Club Team of the Gorillas of Destiny. Defending the IWGP Tag Team Championships. Uh, this one seems a little odd to me because Yoshihashi and Tomohiro Ishii, I just, I can't even picture those two guys liking one another. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is certainly one of the standouts early that's going to be bringing them in here. Uh, in, inside of a match, you know, we have to see how these dynamics work together. British Heavyweight Championship will be on the line. It's the rematch from Royal Quest. Hiroshi Tanahashi defending against Zack Sabre Jr. Everybody and their brother expects Zack Sabre Jr. to win this match, which is why I'm going with Hiroshi Tanahashi. Uh, I was, I'm was, i with you. We talked through this thing. It was kind of weird that they make the switch while they're in the UK, and now we're getting a defense here with you know maybe you know the beloved uh, Sabre Jr. winning this thing back. Uh, I, I think this is going to see the champ retain here. Yep, I'm right there with you. Monday in Kagoshima, it's going to be the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Championships on the line. Chaos versus Bullet Club once again. Rick, it seems like we're kind of building this. This is the reason I think the, the Yoshihashi and Ishii team was put together, just so they could do two Chaos versus Bullet Club matches for the Tag Team Championships. Will Ospreay and Robbie Eagles take on El Fantasmo and Taija Ishimori, the current defending champions? We're going to get to see Will Two Belts? I was going to say, you know, just outside of the chaos and bullet club, a uh, little bit of the, the bubbling, if you will, between those. Hey, it's about watching Osprey here. I mean, he's, he's on a mission to collect those belts. Hey, we, we argued it. You got to think that he believes that he got screwed in that PWI 500. He wants to keep rolling into this next one to, to let him know that it, that's, that should have been his spot. How about we do a big angle here? Like, what if Robbie Eagles turns on Osprey and rejoins the Bullet Club and this whole thing was all a ruse so that the, the three junior heavyweights could beat down the current junior heavyweight champion? Well, and then you've got – then you got, you know, the other story. All right, Osprey, uh, you could go into it, you know, just not rejoining Bullet Club, but you, you kind of think you're too good for our division. You think you can float back and forth? 
You're not you're not our champion. And you've now you've got competitors lined up for him. And of course, it's all building the El Fantasmo versus Will Ospreay for the junior title. For the January 4th contract, the the right to challenge the IWGP World Heavyweight Champion at Wrestle Kingdom, Kota Ibushi defends his briefcase against one of the men who beat him inside of the G1 in Kenta. Rick, this is going to be one of those uh, sit on the edge of your seat matches and hope that nobody dies things. I, I was going to say, you you put out there, sit on the edge of your seat, I'm going to say, hold your breath. Yeah. And, and right now, you know, both it's, it's some lingering injuries here uh, are going to be walking on eggshells. We don't see anything major go down here, but that's not going to be that's not going to be the case. No pun intended here, because these guys, what they only know one speed, and that's 110. Yeah. And these two guys, especially in a striking battle, it could get real violent real quick. This tour is going to be headlined in Kobe on the 22nd. Your big main event that night, IWGP Intercontinental Championship on the line. And we're seeing these two go at it in tag matches all throughout this tour leading to this Kobe date. Switchblade Jay White challenges Tetsuya Naito for the IWGP Intercontinental Championship. Um, And the bigger story here is, Rick, it seems now Naito is absolutely on board with putting the Intercontinental Championship on the line at Wrestle Kingdom. It seems to me they are going to unify the Intercontinental and Heavyweight Championship at Wrestle Kingdom. It seems like Kota Ibushi is on board. Tetsuya Naito is on board. Switchblade Jay White has said that he is on board. Really, the only one we haven't heard from is Kazuchika Okada, the holder of the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship, who probably just plain doesn't give a shit about the Intercontinental title. Well, you know, at this point, you know, these are all people chasing him. He has the grand right. prize. I mean, why, why does he want anything else? And it, it's going to be we're going to wait a little bit to, you know, to get to that point where he has to address it or have it, you know, kind of his hand forced in the matter. But I, well, I don't even say to be forced, because I completely agree. Why would he care? And you should have you defined your championships like that. That's why we know they're important as you're moving through your ranks. I think the bigger stories we talked about a couple weeks ago is Naito doesn't seem the same. And he might need some time off. And if you're going to do it, do it now so that you're not you know, risking him when you get to the dome. If we are going to unify these titles, if it's if it's going to be one person holding both belts, how is that not Tetsuya Naito at the end of Wrestle Kingdom? I mean, this has literally been what he has been chasing for the last going on, what, six years is holding both of these belts. And it, when you look at their storytelling, too, this is what we get. And in a heavy, I've been outside of these belts as well. And, you know, how, and how much we talk about, you know, how the champ, the heavyweight champ might not really care because it's the kind of we've seen Naito and how he's treated that belt because he he's so driven to become the world champion. And it's just, and just enough to do that, to have that headline to main event, Wrestle Kingdom. Uh, with Okada, though, you talk about a man who achieves everything. I mean, he is your, your flag bearer. I mean, this would be a tremendous honor for him. I can see him getting there with, with Kota Ibushi. The love, the admiration. I mean, you know, the outpouring from that audience if he was to be the, that last one there with both of those championships. Those were three great arguments. And then again, you got that one with Jay White. And then there's the cracker. You. Yep. Yeah. And the heat. And you want to talk about an eruption. An eruption that would have blown the roof off of that place is if you had Jay White emerge from Wrestle Kingdom, the, the, the grandest show, the grandest show for New Japan. And then you've got the Cracker Jack, and he's got all your gold. Dude, that would be – I wonder – they could almost do the, the when Jericho won both belts. You could almost do that all over again. And have Switchblade like take out Kota Ibushi and then take out Okada, and, and Jay White standing tall at the end. Like you, you look at these names. You see Naito, you see Ibushi, you see Okada, and then there's Switchblade. And you're like, Switchblade ain't winning that shit. He's totally Chris Jericho. He's like, no way. There's no way Jericho's winning those fucking belts. Like, come on, Kurt Angle, The Rock, and Stone Cold, and you're Jericho's going over. Get the fuck out of here, man. He's made a career off of those two wins. And I think, you know, as, as we lay it out here, you can make great arguments for, for each of these, each of these competitors. And that's what you want, right? 
You want compelling. You, you want a, anything can happen. Ideally. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about AAA. AAA invades the garden this weekend. Well, not really. They're, inv- they're, they're, they're invading the Hulu theater because they couldn't sell tickets in the garden. But the Hulu theater is attached to the garden. And AAA is going to be there on Sunday. A uh, couple of big matches announced, but Rick, they only have four matches announced for this show, and I can't help but wonder if that's part of the reason they're having a hard time selling tickets. Uh, your main event, Blue Demon Jr. is going to take on Dr. Wagner Jr. We just saw this at the main event at Triple Mania. Everybody thought Dr. Wagner was going to retire, and then he was like, two days later, nope, I'm not retiring. Let's do it again. No DQ inside of the garden. Rick, if you enjoy blood, guts, and violence, this match is absolutely for you. Well, as we, look, we talk that bigger picture, we're worrying about if this thing is selling. Yeah, I think it's you know it has a lot to do with the style. You know, a lot of people just you know, especially in the Northeast, they're not really it down with that lucha style. Uh, hasn't been doesn't seem like on a national level that there's been overwhelming promotion on this thing. No. And I wonder maybe if, you know, if they would try something like this again, they're going to need a partner up here and, and someone that's really going to help drive, you know, that, that ever, that advertising machine for them. Isn't that what AEW is for? Like, I'm surprised AEW is not being featured on this show. I mean, they're partners with AAA. You mean to tell me that Cody and the Bucks and Kenny, like they wouldn't want to wrestle in the garden? Uh, You know, I wonder too, it's, you're heading back to that garden. Well, they already removed themselves, you know, before they said, you know, they didn't want anything to do with that other garden show. Well, that other garden show, but why not this garden show? Well, I mean, in this one, I mean, it's a smaller one. You're not, you're filling the garden's parking lot and you're wrestling in exhibit hall B. Well, the, the, the reason they're wrestling in exhibit hall B is because they couldn't sell tickets in the garden. They had the garden secured. Well, it, it Maybe, you know, I know we've got Kenny going in there to take on, you know, for the, to take on Phoenix for the championship. But it does seem that they are pulling back a little bit with their outside involvement. They really want to focus in and, and make sure people, you know, that and, and don't confuse. Maybe maybe it's a confusion thing. They want you to be able to identify AEW and not this involvement with everybody else. Well, I guess there is one AEW match on this show. It just happens to be for the AAA Tag Team titles. It's going to be the Lucha Brothers taking on LAX or the Dead Presidents or PNP, whatever the hell you want to call them, Santana and Ortiz. It's going to be for the AAA Tag Titles. It's like the AEW Tag Team Division just also happens to be the AAA Tag Team Division. Well, you talk about outside involvement here. You've got uh, AEW is in the in the tag match here, but they all they're all shared alike. And we've got a role reversal as it's the Impact Women just won flip flop the championship for for the for the ladies match here. Yeah, Taya challenges Tessa Blanchard for the Reina de Reinas championship, and then we have a big six man tag match announced: Kane Velasquez. The Impact Wrestling World Champion Brian Cage and Psycho Clown take on Los Mercionos and Rey Escorpion Tejano Jr. and Taurus. Uh, Rick, I, these four matches, I mean, if, if this is a Twitch show, I'll watch it. Yeah, I, you know, I want to see some more details. And I'll admit, I, maybe I didn't study up on this one as much as I should have. Uh, so it's a Sunday show. Is it running? Is it like a, a matinee? Is it evening? I'm pretty sure it's running opposite a Clash of Champions. See, I, I think this would have been something tremendous to, to run in the afternoon. Go a little different, as I was talking about before. You know, people are, now we're so we're so the norm is that you got to have you know wrestling on during the week at night. And let's go back to something different. I, I as you laid out there, if this would have been on Twitch uh, Sunday afternoon, I would have. You know, t- going out for the games, I got a promotion. So I got be it. I have my laptop there, and I have this on. Yeah, yeah, sure. That didn't help him sell tickets either. Uh, let's talk about Clash of Champions. Run through a preview for this action-packed card. Um, Rick, I, I believe there's 11 matches on this show, and 10 of them are championship matches, and the other one is Roman. So 10 championships on the line at Clash of Champions. What do you think of this as a concept, having all these championships defended in one night? Because I feel like it just devalues all the championships. Uh, and I, I get you, you know, it plays to the gimmick there. My biggest concern as I look across this company is that just between these two brands that we have, 
or is it 205 in this one too? Yeah. Yeah. The cruiserweight title is on the line. Okay. So, I mean, let's call that a half brand. So we're we'll two and a half brands that you've got this many championships. Well, and now it I sounds that's like the, the biggest story that, that, you know, downgrades everything. Well, let, let's go ahead and start there. Drew Gulak takes on Lince Dorado versus Humberto Carrillo for the Cruiserweight Championship. Uh, Rick, the news has come out. It seems like 205 Live is basically going to be absorbed by NXT. Um, and the Cruiserweight Championship will be defended kind of like the Women's Tag Team Championships across basically all brands. But its home is going to be inside of NXT. I like this in theory. It absolutely adds some more depth to the NXT roster. Um, my problem is, number one, I don't think we need the Cruiserweight Championship in NXT. And number two, it seems pretty freaking pointless to me because Adam Cole, the NXT champion, could hold the Cruiserweight Championship. Well, you know what I'd really like to see? Uh, <laughs> let's, let's dissolve. You know, it, it is adopting it. It, it, it's been an epic failure. It, it just shown, and it, I think it's tremendous uh, that they were. It, it opened up opportunities for so many talents. It's opened up so many roster spots, and now people are, are getting those paydays and, and they're getting that experience. Um, but you know, with with the expansion of all this, you've got you know NXT UK. You've got you're growing to two hours. You're going to need more talent for NXT. You still got the B shows NXT that you're running. You've got Raw. You got SmackDown. Those people aren't going anywhere. But let's dissolve 205 in, in namesake. And I'd love to see there if, if you really want to make, you know, show something of importance, you want a big, a big selling point for one of your early programs. Let's merge these titles. I'm down with that. I'm absolutely down with that. Because um, we don't, we don't absolutely need a women's women's singles, a men's heavyweight, a, a North American, a tag and two or five. I mean, that, you know, you've got, you give me two hours of programming in a week and you've got five championships already. Yeah. It's just, it's too much. It's too much. No more belts. And this show is a perfect example of why I keep saying no more belts. I still don't watch 205, so I really don't have any idea what the program is going into this, but I really, really like Drew Gulak. And especially if we're going to try to legitimize the Cruiserweight Championship inside of NXT, I think Drew Gulak is the person to carry it in there. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's going to be... He's already gone over. He's done the crossover. He's worked some of the regulars. I mean, him and Dream, a fantastic crossover match when he went in there for a business. He's done a few others there. And I think, as I said, that'd be a good little program. You could have Drew go in there and say, hey, 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 I'm a champion. I've come from 205. They actually, they gave NXT, you, you were around longer, so they gave you the nod, but they know they needed someone like me to get you over, to get you over that barrier going to television. I'm the selling point. There's your story. And you got a little side thing with him and Cole is an early grab, something that's interesting running against, you know, the crowning the champions over at, at AEW. Speaking of championships that can be defended inside of NXT, let's talk about the Women's Tag Team Championship. Team Hell Yeah defends against Fire and Desire. Um, I, I, I don't really have a strong feeling on either one of these teams because it seems as though Vince McMahon has just completely lost interest in this entire Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross storyline. It seems like they're just kind of out there filling TV time at this point. But I don't necessarily see a change here either. So I guess I'll go with Team Hell Yeah to retain. Yeah, I think they'll probably prolong this uh, just because, you know, where do you move? What's next for the for the d direction of the division? I think they'll prolong it here. I do think eventually you, you will get, especially with all this new focus, things that are happening. Uh, Mandy's going to get her time. She's going to get pushed. She She's the baby doll. She's the beauty that they want. That, that's always been a selling point for them. And even in that, you know, keeping her with the bill, the incredibly beautiful herself and hits a different demographic, you know, and you're out there on the, the PC PR movement with her. I can't wait until survivor series when they try to tell me that this is the one time of a year when raw and SmackDown compete against one another, uh, because we have another glaring example on this show as the revival are going to challenge the new day for the SmackDown tag team championships. The revival actually belong to the raw roster. Um, Reg, I guess this kind of ties into the WWE championship. This could be a really 
great night for New Day, or this could be a really bad night for New Day. Yeah, I, the storyline wise, I what's going on with with Revival and and Woods and and Big E here. Uh, not really so much interested. I mean, I like that they're in here. It gives you some layers to it, but this is really is about the WWE Championship and everything between Randy and and Kofi. But it, it, I'm hoping these guys get some time because I think they will put on one of the more entertaining matches of the evening. I think if they gave these guys time, these guys could absolutely steal the show. I think both of these teams are fantastic. I'm just terrified that it's only going to get about six minutes. What well, or? If that, I mean, as I'm looking at this, 11 matches, I could see this getting pushed to the kickoff show. Oh, that would be awful. That would just be awful. Uh, let's talk about the Raw Tag Team Championships. Um, do you expect this to open the show? Uh, I do, to give them a little bit of that, that break. Book uh, end the show? Building. Yeah. So, so this will be the opener and then the universal title as your close. So Team Brawlins, Seth and Braun, going to defend against Team Rudolph for the Raw Tag Team Championships. Um, I think I'm going with Brawlins to retain. I think we're going to get a two belts out of this. Uh, it, it just seems too obvious to me that they would have Ziggler and Rude take these championships and, you know, off of a misfire, like Braun accidentally hits Seth and, and Bobby Rude sneaks in and, and takes the cover. I think it's too soon. I think it's a swerve in a, inside of a swerve. Like we're all anticipating the swerve and the swerve is going to be that we don't get one. Well, no, I think uh, in Vince's mind, and this is a, a, an old tactic of his, you want to keep those belts on those two. And that's why I think that we're going to, this isn't going to end here. We're going to get some kind of finish where they're going to prolong this thing and allow those belts to keep that tension. All right, you guys are, you're showing cracks here. Maybe you can't coexist. You both want the Universal Championship, but you still got to act as tag team champions and you still got to defend and you still got to go out there and work together. I, I didn't agree with it initially. I, I don't like the maneuver, but it's happening there. So we talk about positives. We talk about solutions. That's how you, that's how you do it. And, and that's where you go here. Now, how do we get there? Because they got to go over. Absolutely believe that they're going over. But where will we create that tension? There's got to be something in that match. And maybe maybe that's where you interject the fiend to be, start playing these mind games. The thing I don't understand about this match is why is it Bobby Roode and Dolph Ziggler? Why is it not Anderson and Gallows? Because throughout this entire storyline, right, you have AJ Styles, Anderson, and Gallows. They're the ones that keep interjecting themselves into this program. AJ Styles takes on Cedric Alexander for the U.S. title. Anderson and Gallows aren't even on this show. Like, obviously, they, they keep injecting AJ, Anderson, and Gallows so that there's heels to play off of going into the match. Why aren't they involved in the match? Um, maybe they're doing them a solid and they don't want to go out there and be like, okay, uh, you know what? Take the night off. We're not going to have you lose another match. So do you think Anderson and Gallows are the ones that finally end up taking the championships from Seth and, and Braun? I mean, that would make sense. Well, I mean, they're the ones that gave them to him. So I mean, wouldn't it come full circle for them Andrew to be the ones back. to get them back? Yeah, and that and Gallows is one of the few guys inside the company that can look Braun Strowman in the eye. Right. So that certainly helps. Uh, Cedric Alexander got a huge win in the main event of Monday Night Raw. Then he got to drink some beer with Stone Cold Steve Austin. I'm not sure if he thought that was a bigger honor or if AJ thought it was a bigger honor taking a stunner from Stone Cold Steve Austin because AJ looked like he'd been waiting to take that stunner his entire life, and he sold the shit out of it. AJ Styles, still one of the best in the world. I'm going with him to retain the United States Championship over Cedric Alexander. And unfortunately, I'm afraid that Cedric Alexander goes to the land of buddy murphy remember when buddy murphy had those couple great matches like he had one against roman then he had one against brian and then he was never seen again i'm, I'm afraid that's what's going to happen to cedric alexander here well i i think if that happens it's it's are you going to get lost in the shuffle and i i've really given this some thought before we hit the air uh cedric seems like he he it seems like he's grabbed the attention uh maybe someone new is in charge back there and that exactly screams to me paul Heyman. yeah uh you know he, he's got a good look He's charismatic, you know, in his body language, good move set. He's exciting, uh, but he's going to have to be able to find that personality to continue on. And you've got a few individuals in there that kind of fit that mold. You know, mainly one that jumps out to me is when we're talking about 
you know, real competition and you're trying to get your spot on that card is he's going to be up against Ricochet to kind of fill a certain role and, and fill that, you know, it, it takes so many acts to put on the show. Uh, but within that, you know, there can only be the top spots for certain spots and it's going to be between those two. But yeah, I think it ends here, but he's had a, a tremendous showcasing here. We'll see how he transitions that, but you got to keep rolling with AJ. Shinsuke Nakamura takes on the Miz for the Intercontinental Championship. Uh, Miz looking to become like an 812 time Intercontinental Champion at this point, just trying to erase Chris Jericho from the WWE record books. In that respect, I'm going with the Miz to win this championship, and it wouldn't surprise me if it's somehow, in some way, Sami Zayn's fault. Uh, I agree with you 100. I was actually going to lay it out that way. All right, so I guess we're getting to the big matches now. Our our our, our centuple main event. Bailey takes on Charlotte in Charlotte for the SmackDown Women's Championship. I still have no idea how I'm supposed to feel about either one of these girls going into this match. If there's one match on this card that I could justify outside interference in, it's this one. This match was booked when Bailey was a baby face. She has since turned heel. She's got the whole thing going on with Sasha Banks. I think we just get some kind of a screwy finish here. So Bailey retains the championship and both of these girls kind of split off and go their separate ways here. Uh, I, I think that's what we get. Maybe I, I don't know who that is, what direction you go in. Uh, not exactly sure how we get here I, I, because it, they've been all over with this thing. I have, I'm not invested in it. And I know it's, I'm usually, uh, I've got so many storylines to share with you for Char Char, but I don't have this time because I'm not really that invested. I do know though that Bailey needs to continue this win, continue this hot streak that she's got and try to, you know, continue to get more momentum behind her. Kind of the same thing with Becky and Sasha. Like, I, I just, I don't feel like this match should be happening yet. Wait, Sasha Banks just came back after being off for months. She gets one win over Natalia, and now she's getting a shot at Becky Lynch. Like, I feel like this is page one of the book. This is far from the blow off. It wouldn't surprise me if somehow, like, if Charlotte gets involved in this match going after Sasha because of something that happens with Sasha, like trying to trip up Charlotte in the other match. And both of these two matches are somehow connected. Can we do a fatal four way and just unify and have the women's champion to float between both shows? Well, they're probably not going to go in that direction, especially because now with the new split and all that, they're coming up um, that they're, we're going to really define, you know, who's where, things like that. To me, that's all the more reason to do it because that, to me, makes championships more valuable. If you win a championship, you get to be on both shows, which should mean double the money. Are the networks okay with that? Well, I mean, I'm just, I'm throwing out ideas here, man. Come well, on, I mean, me a freaking bow I mean, here. Kind of, what I would kind of go with here, I, I would have, yeah, I'd have Sasha get involved to help Bailey retain against Charlotte. Uh, we, we both have had regular conversations. We, Charlotte needs to stay away from playing the baby. She needs to remain the heel or at least a stern tweener. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, I'd have Charlotte kind of storm out and she wouldn't be there to, to return or, you know, potentially return a favor. And then I, I think I'd have Bailey, you know, help Sasha grab, steal that belt. Uh, it, it's been very underwhelming since WrestleMania with Becky. She hasn't, nothing's been memorable. I mean, what's her big thing? That the involvement with Lacey, a mixed tag, uh, title defense and then the SummerSlam with Natalia. I mean, that wasn't, you need something to get her hot again and to give her that fuel, that fire to want to chase, you know, now, you know, former best friends who are running together that are the, the ultimate goons. That's going to give her that fire back. Then you've also got the story of Becky wants a rematch and she's tired. You know, she can't believe that they've done this to her. You mentioned that this could potentially be a cell match. We're going to get multiple cell matches. That's going to happen. So Becky wants to take her to hell. You got the bigger story. Don't have Sasha defend until you get to hell himself because she's never defend successfully defended anything. It's so sad. Uh, Seth Rollins takes on Braun Strowman for the universal championship. And it seems as though the fiend is going to be the, the next challenger. So I, I guess I got to go with Seth Rollins to retain here. I mean, I, I just, it doesn't feel like now is the time for Braun Strowman to take the Universal Championship. Well, and, and 
again, even when, you know, when Seth took it, it wasn't about Seth winning the thing. It was about just taking it off Brock. So now anything that's involved here, if Braun wins, it's, we're not going to be talking about him, you know, claiming the championship. This would be his, that would be his first, correct? Right. Uh, be his first. We're not going to be talking about that. The hot story is going to be the feed. So it goes back to what we were talking about at the top of the show. You've killed King of the Ring. You killed Gable because you're talking about something else. You're completely taking the focus away from something that should be a grand prize that you're promoting right now. And in, so I think, you know, the right move, the safe thing to do there is keep it on set and just let the theme continue to play these mind games. And we're going to have some kind of three way interaction between these or, you know, throwing in uh, just Bray himself, you know, like a, a, some kind of four personality interaction. Any chance that they try to hook Braun Strowman and Bray Wyatt back up together? And I think, you know, that's a great teaser, something involved there. Uh, I, I don't think that's the right move, but you've always got that lingering in the people back in the you know people's minds. Let's talk about Kofi Kingston. Uh, Kofi Kingston defends against Randy Orton for the WWE Championship. And really, this is going to be a defining match in both of these guys' careers because one of these guys is going to be the champion going into the Fox deal. That's that's and that's a pretty big freaking deal. Um, I want to see Kofi retain this championship with the story that they've been telling. I think Kofi has to retain this championship, but going into that Fox deal, I feel like they're going to want it on Randy Orton. Well, we've heard that, you know, they want the look, they want the, the name, the notoriety, and people could argue with us all they want. They're blue in the face, but that's a fact. Go anywhere to any live event. Randy Orton is still over. And you really listen to television. He's still getting the, those big reactions. Randy being Randy just absolutely works for the WWE universe. I'm going into Fox right now. I know you you want that feel good. Kofi's got great. He's got great appeal to the you know different demographics, things like that. But to me, you want we're talking about a, a more realistic sports approach. What's the best in sports when you're chasing the hated champions? New England Patriots. You, you, we talked about watch, it on HTM Sports. You you watch to see the Patriots go down. That's what you tune into. That's that's the reason. Um, you know why the highest rated games, you know, in baseball, it's it's who you know whoever's playing against the Red Sox and the Yankees, or especially when they're playing each other because they're the they're the hated empires, you know. Uh, Duke basketball, the Lakers, yep, uh, Golden Golden State. Even though they're not bad guys, but because they're you know they're perceived that way because they're, they're this powerhouse. You get that with Randy Orton. There is more intrigue, more fire behind your programming if you hate the people at the top. Yep, and and the money is always in the chase, and especially going into SmackDown on Fox, it's time to spark up a chase. Uh, let's talk about your main event. Yeah, that's right. I'm putting Roman Reigns in the main event. Nothing is bigger than attempted murder, and so Roman Reigns is going to try to pin Eric Rowan's shoulders to the mat for three seconds because Eric Rowan tried to murder him. Uh, Rick, this has been the most awful storyline probably in the last decade like this has been really really bad by wwe standards what do you think does roman just put eric rowan down and we're done with this and we can just move on i think what we've really got to do with it you know the bigger question is you need you need the loser to go away for a while roman's not going anywhere i mean how, how do you do this so Obviously, you got the stupid point. Yeah, we're not going. We're not pressing charges. We're not going to criminal court. We're not going to civil court. We're not going to the people's court. We're going to Vince McMahon's court. And, and I'm going to prove that you were. Here is my justification. Here is your punishment. I'm going to beat you up in a no disqualification match. The Eric Rowan thing feels very, very much like the Jinder Mahal thing. Like it's just completely out of nowhere. Not that I think they can market Eric Rowan to the people of India. He doesn't look anything like them, but it, it feels like just completely out of left field where this push has come from. And I don't think anybody necessarily believes that Eric Rowan was the brainchild behind this entire plot to assassinate well, hey, Roman hey, Reigns. Let's, let's remember, you know, when he left the Wyatt family, he, he showed he was how intellectual he was. You know, he, he was that hidden genius of the group. You know, maybe he could put this together, uh, but you know, back to my point. I mean, what does he? What do you do after this? Pro, after this match, you know, what happens? Like, okay, yeah, you tried murdering me, and I beat you up, but 
let's go to work together because now I got this beef with this new guy and I don't care if you're still around. That, that doesn't work. And that's where, that's where you're going to watch crossing the line where you, where you, when you blur those lines. You've really got to watch yourself here. And it's never worked. We've seen this in other promotions. It, it's never, it's never ends well for anyone, and, and especially here for Rowan. And everyone's saying, oh, man, he's looking good. He cut that good promo. Maybe he's getting a push. Maybe they just know he's expendable when they try to get the hell out of this thing. Or maybe you were right. We talked about it with the Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman match. Maybe Braun Strowman rejoins Bray Wyatt, rejoins The Fiend. Could this all be that Bray Wyatt is trying to murder Roman Reigns? Because that would make a lot of sense. Bray Wyatt and Roman Reigns have an awful lot of history together. And Bray Wyatt once said, anyone but you, Roman. Anyone but you. Like, could could this lead to the Fiend versus Roman Reigns? You've got, let's start something there. Because we were talking about the Fiend before and maybe him and Braun coming back there. And we switched gears and popped into my head here. You, just this past week, you had Bray saying, or it was you know more than two weeks ago, I can't really remember, but he said, he brought up, I'm coming for you, Seth and Braun, because of our history and things that you've done to me. So that says he hasn't forgotten things. And there's tremendous history between, you know, between uh, Bray or The Fiend and Roman, you know, whichever one, you know, which, if you want the light or the darkness, but Roman has had an effect on that. That could tie together. I mean, could you even could you get Harper off of the shelf here? Bray has a new set of puppets. Could the fiend go get his old puppets and reunite them? Well, and that's the line that actually got me thinking about it was when we heard this supposed good promo from Eric Rowan, he made the comment that he's nobody's puppet. Which immediately I start thinking of puppets on the WWE show, and it takes me to the Firefly Funhouse. Like, and what, what do you, let's see what you got. I mean, you got Abby the witch, right? You got the rabbit, you got the pig and the buzzard, right? Yep. So, I mean, those could all play in. He has just as many puppets here, essentially, or characters. Uh, I mean, you know, the witch represent Abigail. And then you could go with the other three in any direction because it'd be Rowan, Harper and Strowman. Could we see both? You know, may, maybe this is the fiend dominates. And the Fiend takes over everything, you know, on both shows, you know, maybe that's how we end up getting to the Fiend as champion and building a program hot enough for hell in a cell between him and Seth Rollins. Or, hey, let's, let's see, we're, we're getting crazy here, but we also got another puppet that shows up on that show. We got the Devil Vince. It was me, Roman. It was me, Roman. Oh. There you go. Uh, the King of the Ring finals, we, we mentioned it earlier, been moved to Monday Night Raw, no longer going to be on Clash of Champions. Are, are we going to get King Fuckface? Is, is this just going to end up with Baron Corbin wearing the crown now? Because they did Chad Gable just no favors there with him going over Shane McMahon to bring it all the way back to the beginning of the show. The story was far more about Shane McMahon and Kevin Owens than it was about Chad Gable winning the biggest match of his life and qualifying for the finals of the King of the Ring. Hmm. Uh, you know what? Let's sit on this one and we'll talk about it in the locker room. So that's going to wrap things up for this week's show. Thanks for listening. And if you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button. Then visit the entire HTM podcast network online, hitting the marks. Dot com. Be sure that you stay tuned in to Last Word on Pro Wrestling.com all weekend for all the news coming from throughout the entire world of professional wrestling. God knows there's going to be an awful lot of it. Visit our friends over at the Gorilla as they tell us stories, pro wrestling storytellers. Be sure that you find Huckleberry and I this Monday inside the locker room, hackerhameen.podbean.com. We'll be going through all of Clash of Champions and giving you our thoughts going forward into Monday Night Raw and Tuesday Night SmackDown. You can find me across all social media platforms at NotJargo, RBB. How do the peeps, the freaks, and the geeks find you? Well, as a par for the course, keep up with me, Rick Victor, across all social media platforms at the Real RBV. I like to encourage everyone, uh, if, if you're in the area, if you're looking to make a, a great road trip where we can get away from professional wrestling, right here in Harrison, Ohio, at Danny B's Lounge. 
Uh, Saturday, October 26th, we are debuting a little promotion called Hot Tag Wrestling. It is, it's going to be like the Wild West of pro wrestling. It's going to be an afternoon show. We're going to cater to that far atmosphere. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to have some bar brawls. we got some fierce ladies. we got high flyers. We've got a few little surprises on the way that we're going to hopefully be able to announce here. But it is going, it's going to be over the top. It, it's going to be wrestling like you remember it. It's Shotgun Saturday Night Personified. Uh, so, you know, keep what's going on uh, on my personal social media pages, pages again at The Real RBB, or you can find us on Facebook at Hot Tag Marketing. Uh, we're right now, we're in the process of dropping some big names. We've got our main event announced. It's Jocelyn Navarro, hot and coming indie talent in here in Ohio. She's going to be taking on Major League Wrestling's Casey Lennox in our main event. Uh, legendary, legendary Larry D. Great name on independent scene. He's going to be on the show. Ricky Cardinal. We've got a, 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 this tag team that I found. These guys are crazy. I found them way out in the woods here. Way out in the woods here in, in, in Kentucky. Uh, they're pretty much, they're like the Godwins and meet the Briscoes. And they call themselves the Eds. Uh, and they already get wild. We're excited to have them. But it's Hot Tag Wrestling. Uh, make sure you check us out and keep up what's going on. And we appreciate the support. That's it for this week's show. We'll talk to you Monday in the locker room for now. We're off like a prom dress. See ya! Point your fingers. Label me. I don't give up. I'll be your bad guy. Stop, stop, go! Yeah.